John, welcome. We are so delighted that you are going to be in Boulder this summer and be our composer in residence and the, the big performance of your works on July 13th. Um, and I've always been a huge admirer of your music, as you well know. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about the whole idea of having an entire evening of your music, and then let's get to the, to the pieces. So uh, how often have you had uh, an evening entirely dedicated to your orchestral music? It's happened several times. It's happened in, um, in Sao Paulo and in Sydney, where they, the orchestra did an entire concert of my music. And it's very exciting. Uh, those events were wonderful. Absolutely, that, that is true. And of course, whenever there's one of your operas performed, the whole evening is dedicated to you as well. But, but so uh, we had some conversations about which pieces to choose. And I, I was kind of very keen to do the gazebo dances because it represents, you know, very early Coriolano. And, exactly. and I just think it's such a wonderfully spirited contrast, uh -huh. beautiful way to invite people into your world, at least your world of the early 70s. Right. What, what are your memories of, of writing that piece? Well, the gazebo dances was originally written as a series of piano forehand pieces for people who I love who play the piano and are involved in music, but not professional performers. For example, the first woman is dedicated to my mother and her best friend. They used to play piano forehands all the time. And yeah. so I wrote a series of four pieces, much as Samuel Barber did in Souvenirs, where he wrote four friends and piano four hands. And uh, each movement is, it's a highly spirited work. There's one adagio, but basically it's high tempo and a lot of fun. And reminds me when I orchestrated it of the gazebos in the uh, towns that play these bands that play gazebos and all the people, you know, spread tablecloths and uh, sit in, in, on, on the grass and, and listen to the music, this kind of outdoor music. So I've, I've named it gazebo dances for that reason. Wonderful. Images of your youth in Connecticut, of course. Yes. You know, all those little towns have the gazebos on the village green. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's absolutely beautiful. And, and as fun as it is and spirited as it is, already that adagio has great depth. I mean, your music for me is always deeply moving. Um, but already at, at, that, at that point, I think, you know, it's almost as if you couldn't write even a fun piece without saying something profound. Um, I, I hope you love that as much as I do. Oh, I do. Thank you so much for saying that. It is a dear adagio for me, and it was uh, written a long time ago. Um, and so I, I treasure the feelings I had when I wrote it. Uh, absolutely. So th then um, we had the conversation, and I very much wanted to program One Sweet Morning, which you wrote just over 10 years ago, maybe oh, 12 years ago, oh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was to commemorate the 10th anniversary of 9-11, correct? That's correct. The New York yeah. Philharmonic commissioned me and Stephanie Blythe sang it with the New York Philharmonic. Uh, what I did in that piece, I wanted, they wanted a remembrance, remembrance, but not a literal remembrance of 9-11, but something about the aftermath and what it meant. And I picked four poems of four different centuries and also four different locations all about the war, the idea of war and destruction. And the last one, One Sweet Morning, about the idea that peace will come one day and it will all be over. It's idealistic, of course, but that person who wrote that particular poem, One Sweet Morning, is Yip Harburg, who wrote Finian's Rainbow and The Wizard of Oz and many musicals. And people think of him as a show composer. And yet he wrote this extremely deep and beautiful poem about the uh, rose that will bloom one day over the soldiers' graves and it will pass that if that will be over. That time will be over. He says, "Peace will come one sweet morning." Well, right. it's it's so beautiful, and the and the music that you've written to express all of that is is just stunningly moving. I mean, it's it's hard to, for me to think of it without getting a little bit teary. I mean, this is going to be really quite a profound experience. And what that's what I kind of love about this program is that we've got the gazebo dances are so full of joy and wit, um, and then a piece that is extremely intense actually, and uh, and features some of your you know, chaotic music, if you don't mind me calling it that, where you just let people go freely. And right. it's really such an interesting challenge for a conductor and for the orchestra, because it's going to be different every single time you do it. Um, but you intentionally create a kind of clamor of chaos, it seems like. Uh, is that the second movement is from the Iliad, 
of uh, Homer and its Patroclus and his battle and the battlefields in ancient, you know, Greece and Rome, ancient Greece were situated in different places. And I situate the three trumpets uh, in different places when they play these battle calls. So it's coming from the right side, the left side, the back side, et cetera, so that you get the feeling of the chaos of war, of the actual, what happens when these chariots are with shields or, and swords and, and spears are running into each other. And this fantastic dialogue of Homer uh, about the, the death and, 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 and destruction and the glory of this one man in this particular chapter of the Iliad. It's very, uh, it's very forceful music and, and, and you get the feeling of the war in that movement. Whereas the next movement after that, uh, which is called the uh, war, so war South of the Great Wall is by Li Po in the eighth century. So we have ancient Greek eighth century and it's about a war on the Great Wall. And the thing that is so interesting there is it's told from the vantage point of a woman who sees her husband and children fighting in the distance on the Great Wall where people are dying and things are toppling. And you get this mother's view of what it's like to have your loved ones fighting a war and almost like ants, she calls them, in this rosy red cauldron of war. So all of these poems relate to this idea of war, but in different ways. Uh, right. The first one uh, by Shelov Milos was written in 1944 during World War II in Warsaw, Poland. This is, was, the first one. this is the first song we're talking one, about. Yeah. The song on the end of the world. And this is about the idea that when the end of the world comes, we will not know it. We will be enjoying our garden. We will be watching uh, children play. Uh, a bumblebee, etc., and we will not believe it. I mean, there's no herald angel that's going to say it's over. It's, not, it's just going to be over. And this old man who binds tomatoes is saying there will be no other end of the world. There will be no other end of the world but this, in other words. Uh, so they're all different centuries, different countries, different ideas, but they all have the same unity of the idea of war, what it can do, and the hopes for peace. And that was what I wanted to do in this in this work. Now, there's one last thing I'd like to ask you about this, because I, I think everybody would be wondering this. When, you, when you're asked to write a piece like this, you come up with a concept in your mind at a certain point, and then you have to seek the, the poetry. Yes. And I mean, these are such disparate concepts and ideas and periods and so on. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's just incredible to me. So I'm just wondering how long it takes you and how you go about that process of finding just the right poetry to inspire you. I went to the 92nd Street Y. I already had One Sweet Morning. I knew I wanted that as the ending, but I wanted these other texts from other centuries and other times and places. Um, I, I went to the 92nd Street Y that has a vast uh, poetry collection. And I spoke to one of the people there and asked for some suggestions to give me works to look at. And he gave me pieces, various poems to look at and a variety. And I said, I want a variety from all times, from all cultures, uh, but I want it all to be about this idea of war. And I chose these after looking at hundreds of copies of different poems, uh, but I chose these four. Um, Fantastic, incredible. Well, it's, it's, it's just the, the creativity behind all of this is, is just astonishing and it's um, it's a very inspiring experience and I, I think everybody who comes to Chautauqua is going to have a little bit of a roller coaster experience because we you know we start with a lot of fun and some beauty but then we go into this very very deep deeply felt and very moving experience with One Sweet Morning and then a much needed intermission I would say okay. um, and, and I'm hoping that by the way although we're talking about it now on video that We'll, we'll introduce each piece just a little bit in the concert. I think that's, if you're agreeable to that, I think that'd be lovely. But then in the second half, we have really one of your most virtuosic pieces. I mean, you have a lot of virtuosic music, actually, for somebody who can write such stunningly beautiful, slow music. You also, on the other side, like your violin sonata is so incredibly yeah. virtuosic. And not to mention your clarinet concerto. Uh, and I mean, so many of your works have great virtuoso play. And triathlon, Tell us about this, written for Tim McAllister, the wonderful 
a saxophone player. And tell us about creating that piece. Well, it was very interesting. I had uh, I had not been accepting commissions because I tend to be very wary of taking on two several commissions at once. I only take one. And I finished composing at one point and I said, you know, I think I'm really um, done. And I sat and then I started sitting in my room and sitting in my room and I thought, you know, I don't know what to do. It so happened that Tim McAllister wrote me a letter several years before that, that I had on my desk in a bin saying, I would love it if you would consider writing a piece for me, any kind of piece. Uh, it would mean so much to me and, and the saxophone community. We never have, you know, a lot of composers writing for us and, and you were the one I would like to write. And so I contacted Tim and said, well, what would happen if I wrote you a concerto? He said, I would be thrilled to do it. And then the San Francisco Symphony came in and commissioned it. We uh, let them know about it and they commissioned the work officially and made a, uh, a premiere date and all of that. Now, I still didn't have a title for the piece, but I knew that I wanted to do, th do something that's quite unusual. Saxophonists actually play all the saxophone. Um, it's not like um, um, other instrumentalists or violinists don't play viola necessarily. And clarinetists can play bass clarinet and E-flat clarinet. But you'll find that the first clarinetist in the orchestra does not do that. That's usually a third player or a second player who does that sort of thing. So the idea that saxophonists, on the other hand, do play all the saxophones, led me to think, what would happen if I wrote a concerto for saxophonist and orchestra, not saxophone and orchestra, and the saxophonist plays three different instruments, one for each movement, uh, and starting with the soprano sax, and then going to the alto sax, and then the baritone sax. I had to leave the tenor out because um, several practical reasons. First of all, the concerto is already a 30 minute work and I was afraid I would write too long a piece. But in addition, there's a simple matter of transporting instruments. Saxophonists do play their own instruments. And you can have a saxophone case that will hold an alto and a soprano. And of course the baritone takes a big case of its own. It's a very big instrument, but you can't add a tenor because you would not be able to take it anywhere. You couldn't what a practical composer you are. <laughs> you couldn't literally take it from one place to the other. You'd have to ship your instruments by freight or something. Sure. And also I, I felt that the baritone, I've always had a love for the baritone sax. The alto is the most beautiful in its melodic contour. And the soprano sax, like the clarinet, has this wild virtuosity in this astronomical range. So I felt I had what I wanted. And then I said, what would happen if I take three different aspects of music making and each movement is dedicated to one of them. So the first one was called leaps. And you will hear the very beginning, he starts in a low note and jumps to the highest note possible of the saxophone and glisses off and the whole orchestra comes in with a crash. And it's all about leaping. It's about leaping from one note to another note. Even the theme goes from high to low range of the saxophone of the soprano sax uh, because it leaps so much, but it's a theme. It's a lyrical theme, but it leaps. And so the whole movement is devoted to the leaping. The second movement was lines. And in that movement, I um, wanted to explore the lyrical lines of melody with the alto saxophone and write a completely melodic movement. There's no dramatic section in it really. It's basically all lyrical. It builds to a certain peak, but never never really goes wild because the saxophonist here is all about lyricism and lines are lyrical lines. And so it's very melodic and it has several melodies that can be remembered and uh, I think um, sound very good on the instrument. Uh, no question and about it. Then we go to the baritone. Now I had originally, um, I, I didn't know quite what to do with the baritone saxophone. Um, I was, um, trying to figure what I could do with also leaps, lines, and L-E da da S. Uh, that is, I was trying to say, can I get a title for the last movement that will be five letters and start with L and end with S. And um, I ended up with licks. <laughs> a lick, a lick, licks are what 
jazz players do a lot, ornamenting and going around and against a melody with licks that they play, these virtuoso licks. So the baritone saxophone is, uh, is tasked with the process of providing these wild licks and wild flourishes, which she does. It's actually a baritone sax that goes into the realm of the soprano sax. It goes so high that my publisher notified me and said, John, you can't do that. They don't mm -hmm. go that high. But Tim McAllister said, I can do that. You can go that high. So uh, I told my publisher, well, my soloist says he can do it. And he sure can do it, but it's very, very, very virtuosic for him. He takes the baritone sax from its lowest register to its highest register and it's wild, that wonderful brassy sound of the baritone sax. And in the high register of how beautiful it can sound. Um, it's really a very stunning instrument and uh, it's a big movement and a difficult one. It's the most difficult movement of, of, the, of the three. Uh, lots of rhythmic complexities in that movement. Oh, I know that. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Yeah. It's a tricky, it's a tricky movement. Yeah, but, but, um, but wonderful. I mean, it's just so, <laughs> so thrilling. And, and you've got, of course, a soloist who has that very rare combination of incredible virtuosity, but with stunning musicianship. Oh, right? yeah. He's just oh, yeah. a musician. When so, he plays uh, lines, uh, I, mean, I, I can weep when he plays lines. He's so beautiful. He, yeah. he, his phrasing is so immaculate and so beautiful. He is a total musician. Uh, and it's also important, this is a saxophone concerto, because saxophones are starting now to come into the fore in classical music. The Naumburg Foundation had its first saxophone competition in its history. I'm on the board of Naumburg, I said, did suggest it, but they did it. And we had two winners that were stunning saxophonists. And I hear that there's a saxophonist, a young concert artist has a saxophonist now on. Um, Stephen Banks, Stephen Banks is remarkable. Yeah. yeah. So that the, these instruments, uh, instrumentalists are starting to get recognized in field of non-jazz, but classical. Well, uh, it's actually a beautiful concerto instrument as well because it has such power. It does. On top of everything else, um, you know, so you can write quite freely um, and give quite thick orchestration, which usually we have to be so careful of. Right. Either when you're composing or conducting to make sure the balances are okay. But with, with the sax, it's a little bit uh, freer. Um, right so tell, tell me how this how the title came about you know the title came after i wrote the piece i had i was going to call it uh a triple play uh like three strikes you know triple play right. and in the premiere um i finally got the title i was shaving one day and i, I this just a word came over to me triathlon what is that i know that word and i go and i google it right away and i say triathlon these virtuosic feats three different virtuosic feats of one person doing the same three feats. This is, the title is perfect, but I had not no title until I was really finished with the third movement. I was just basically trying to figure out a, a better title until it, about meant to be. It, it could easily have been that you thought of the title first and all of it came out of the title, but in fact, it was the other way around. The other way around. It was the other way around. It came after, and I was very lucky to get it. Yeah, absolutely. Let me just ask you one general question that, um, before I let you go. And thank you so much for taking the time. Um, when did you first realize that you could create such beautiful counterpoint, uh, i.e. that you could write a melody and then write accompanying lines that, that work so beautifully with the melody that they complement it? But yet there's, because I find your counterpoint very unusual, very unique, and really your voice. When did that all begin? I can't say. I don't know. It's part of my composing. I started composing late. Uh, when I was in high school, I wanted to be a composer, but I hadn't really written anything. And I wrote the high school alma mater and my high school teacher, uh, she encouraged me to be a composer, unlike my parents. She, she did encourage me. I went to college as a music major, but I went to Columbia and didn't have private lessons with composition, just group composition. And your instrument was piano or? I had no instrument. Uh, I played the piano by ear and could play uh, around, but I didn't know the scales because my mother was a piano teacher and she gave me two lessons and we had a fight and I never studied the piano. I, I took up the clarinet and had three lessons and it was stolen from my high school gym locker. And I was studying with Stanley Drucker, I might add, but uh, I, was, I didn't want to practice. And 
so I didn't, I got by in Columbia just by reading something on the piano halfway, but That's not incredible. well. I should just point out for people who know, Stanley Drucco was at that time and for many decades, the principal clarinetist of the New York Philharmonic. And in fact, your father, John Senior was the concert master for yes. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, many years, right? 20 something? 26, 26 years. 26 years, yeah. Right. So in that environment where your mother is teaching the piano and your father is a great violinist, you actually end up having two lessons at the piano and three lessons at the clarinet. Um, right. And and you become one of the greatest composers of the, 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 of, of the present time or perhaps of any time. Oh, well. Uh, quite extraordinary. <laughs> but anyway, I, 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 I really would want people to know what beautiful music this is, how wonderfully contrasting it is when they see a program with just one composer on it. Um, they might be thinking, oh, the, the same sort of music all evening. Nothing could be further from that's, the truth. It's true. all aspects of, of John Coriolano's extraordinary creativity and from many different periods. We're talking about 72, I think, for gazebo dances, 2010, 11, whenever you wrote that for One Sweet Morning with a wonderful uh, mezzo-soprano. And then uh, what about 2018, 19 triathlon, something 20. like that? I think 20. It was 20. 20. So it's three very different periods. I, you know, like Beethoven, we can say okay. that. Yes, we can. <laughs> Absurd, but you can say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just did. <laughs> John, it's such a pleasure to chat with you. And we are so looking forward to having you in Boulder. I, I, I hope you'll love it. Have you ever been to Boulder before? I have been to that uh, concert hall once. They did the Pied Piper Fantasy. Michael Christie conducted. Excellent. Many years ago. And they did the uh, James Galway piece. Uh, the Pied Piper Fantasy I wrote for him, a 35 minute piece with kids and, and, and rats in the orchestra playing like rat music and children playing tin whistles and flutes uh, that was played there once. Fantastic. Uh, it's a beautiful place to play, I must say. It's a fantastic place. It's one of the great atmospheres and great auditoriums um, anywhere, especially to have that in the summertime is very, very rare. Yes. And um, yeah, Michael Christie is actually coming back this summer and will we'll be conducting his own program. So we're delighted about that. Good. Great. Well, John, thank you so much. And uh, we will all look forward to seeing you around uh, July 13th, which is the night of the concert. So for everybody who loves to hear just beautiful music uh, in, in a language that is completely original and completely individual, um, please don't miss this opportunity to, to come and hear John Coriolano's wonderful music. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Peter.